owned and operated a restaurant, worked for a number of studios, did some national commercials and a movie. He even performed in summer stock in New Hampshire. And he volunteered for nonprofits and arts, social services, and education. Even though Even though he moved away from Southern California, he remained fascinated by the desert. A love affair begun when he was just 16, and he knew then he would return and live here one day. Recently, while living in Oregon, he was inspired by the book, The One Thing, and it became clear that the one thing he wanted to do was return to California and the desert. It was the right time for him to make his move to the Coachella Valley. In September, he arrived to take on the position of Cabot's first executive director. And he says, in his words, it's been an amazing eight months. I'm the most fortunate man in the valley. And then continuing in his words, I love being on the Pueblo grounds, getting to know the desert cities, working with an amazing board, staff, and volunteers, and most of all, I enjoy getting to know all the incredible people I've met. The man I most enjoy getting to know is Cabot Yerksa. He is inspiring and inspires me every day. I hope the work we do at the Pueblo inspires others as well. And I give you Eric Shea. And I've got to find my notes. <laughs> Good evening. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Can you hear me with that note? Uh, thank you, Audrey, Larry, members of the Historical Society, uh, for inviting me here uh, tonight. This is my third soup supper since I arrived in Desert Hot Springs, and it's, they're, just a, they're a lot of fun. I wasn't involved in any kind of organization like this up in Oregon. And I really appreciate the, the community, and especially learning about Cabot and his strong affinity for community and community building and how communities build stronger ties within a community. It's really wonderful to be here. And it, it was uh, a cosmic alliance that got me to Desert Hot Springs. On the day that I finally decided I was going to leave Oregon and make the move down to the desert. I was all excited and happy, and then the next day had a major panic attack because I hadn't made the decision, and left my job, getting ready to sell everything when I saw the posting for the executive director job here in, at Cabot's Pueblo, and immediately started reading about Cabot and the Pueblo and thought, yep, that's the job I'm going to have. It doesn't matter who else is involved. Uh, the job is mine. And fortunately, since she's here today, Lorraine Becker was very patient with me because the planes were not working to get me down here for an interview, but I did get here. And thank you to all of you in the community who I've met and in welcoming me I'm here to Desert Hot Springs. Thank you, Lorraine. Um, as, as Audrey said, um, we're going to talk about as Cabot's Pueblo Museum. This is uh, one of my favorite places in the whole world. Quickly became that uh, the very first time I stepped on to the grounds. And so what I'm gonna do is, it's sort of gonna be a different approach and discussion about Cabot and the Pueblo, but first we're gonna go and we're going to talk about what the what the Pueblo is. It's, it's, it's unique in so many ways. That Cabot's Pueblo Museum is the only homestead museum in the Coachella Valley. And up there at the Pueblo for, I'm hoping everybody in this room has been. Anybody not there? Um, it really is. Visitors are transported back in time to learn about the early life in the desert and hear about the incredible experiences and stories of Cabot Yerksa. 
His inspiring life as an adventurer, entrepreneur, humanitarian, really did help create the valley that we all enjoy today. Because I often wonder, if he hadn't found the water, when would it have been found? Would the people who have found it shared it with his neighbors? Would they have gone out and dug wells? So everybody who was homesteading back in 1913 had access to water, which was one of the requirements to successfully homestead. And every time I say something of fact, I look back at that table with three members of our history committee, and they promise that they won't grimace or put their head down and go, oh, good Lord, why did we hire him? There's young Cabot. When I was Cabot's age, he was in Nome, Alaska, selling tobacco products to the gold miners. I was wondering what shirt to buy at Nordstrom. <laughs> and I thought I was leading an interesting life. Um, the man, as a young man and as an older man, he does inspire me because he was a participant in life. He wasn't just an observer. And what I find so endearing about him is he went out and he sought out new cultures and peoples and he relished in learning about their traditions and their way of life. And I believe it was all of those experiences that helped create the foundation for the man who ended up moving here to the desert in 1913. And he wasn't just a wonderful man who respected other people. He was the environmentalist back then that we should all aspire to live as today. Use water multiple times. Recycle, reclaim, reuse materials. We don't need new everything. Cabot demonstrated 100 years ago uh, that reusing materials was definitely a way to go. And his use of water needs to be duplicated a thousand times over here in the valley. Um, as we know, Cabot was a great adventurer as a young man. And I think that sort of, I can understand that I came from the small state of Oregon. And Oregon is a lovely, wonderful state to live in. But he was in the Midwest. And I think it wasn't enough for him. He just, he wanted more from his life. He was a little bit restless. And I don't think he envisioned the life he wanted happening in Minneapolis. So when he arrived at the Garden Station in 1913, he was 29 years old. He was broke, married, child on the way, and probably, from what I know about him, a little beat down from life. But he still carried his incredible spirit, determination, and true grit, because those were the qualities that he had to have. In fact, all of the homesteaders had to have. So he could successfully homestead his 160 acres, much of which he aptly and appropriately named um, Miracle Hill. Now, just so everybody sort of has a, a brief summary of Cabot and his life leading up to landing here at Desert Hot Springs, we're certainly going to run through some of the highlights of Cabot, because I think it's important to know because he, it was the young man who became the, the old man up at the Pueblo. Cabot was born and spent his early life in Pembina in the um, Dakota Territories. And when he was little, the family moved to Minneapolis. They opened the store, Mercantile, and it proved to be very successful. And at 17, he found his way with $1,700 in his pocket to Chicago, where he bought tobacco products, and he got it all up to Nome, Alaska. People from Palm Springs had trouble getting to Desert Hot Springs. This young man went from Minneapolis to Chicago all the way up to Nome. I guess it's about perspective. Um, <laughs> While he was in Nome, he became friends with the Inupiat Eskimos. And during his very cold winter there, he lived with them, and he learned their cultures, traditions, and their craft. And it was that very young age where he just continued his fascination with other people and cultures. And he really had a, a respect for them, and they for him. His father called him back home, and the family embarked on an adventure, and they all moved to Cuba. Again, Minneapolis to Cuba, where they started a housing development in, on the island. And they traveled back and forth from Cuba to the United States for a few years, and we know that they were at the 1904 World's Fair in St. Louis because the Yerksa family sold jellies there. Then 
businesses and residences in New York City, San Francisco, and then finally they all found their way to Riverside County. And by the time Cabot was 25 years old, he was married, yes, 25 married, got it right, um, and he was postmaster in Sierra Madre. I was trying to think of what I was doing at 25. Um, and the family became citrus farmers, and they were very successful at it, and their orchards were expanding and growing in numbers. And then, unfortunately, the Great Freeze of 1913 hit. The family lost everything. And it was, it was understandably very difficult. His father, Fred, soon passed away, and his mother, Nellie, and his younger brother, Harry, moved north. And Cabot wandered to Ohio, um, excuse me, Idaho, and fortunately, his good friend, Bob Carr, got hold of him and said, wow, we can homestead desert. $10. He didn't have much more than $10, but he got on the train and landed it at the Garnet Station, and the two of them headed out across the desert and landed at Two Bunch Palms, where Bob took his 160 acres and up the hill where Cabot took his. And he was successful. He had his family, but he did divorce. Um, he became friends with the native population. Uh, he looked after his neighbors. Again, all of this community, get to know people. Don't just sit on the sidelines and take care of himself in his own little world. He was all about the people around him, making sure they were safe and secure. Um, and of course, he found the water, which is just fascinating how he did that. Um, he did leave the desert, but he would come back. He'd go earn money and come back so he could successfully homestead because he had to bring things back with him. And he found himself at 58, and he still had some adventures left in him. Now, I'm not quite 58, and I cannot imagine building a Pueblo. I helped my parents build their house when I was 18 with saws and electric tools and people carrying the really heavy stuff. I can't imagine what real true grit he had within himself to begin building this incredible Pueblo just up on the hill. It was 1941. DHS, the city he helped found, was growing and the water was flowing. Celebrities were all about. He was soon remarried to Portia. But most of all, I think Cabot wanted to build the Pueblo so he had a place to tell his stories. Because even though he was a private man, he loved telling his stories and his life experiences. And he was able to do it through this amazing collection of travel memorabilia, photographs, paintings, pottery, textiles, rugs, gifts that he had received to share with people because it was, it was his life and it was interesting and it helped him raise some money selling things in the trading post that he had and his museum space upstairs in the Pueblo. And he was successful, and I am now, at 2014, 15, honored to be up at the Pueblo, ensuring with the incredible board, staff, history committee, our docent volunteers and other volunteers, to keep, the, uh, to keep Cabot's Pueblo alive and vibrant, safe and secure, for visitors to continue come visiting as often and as long as they want. So, that's sort of Cabot in a nutshell, and I think every person in this room likes him quite a lot. So we're not gonna talk about Cabot in just the normal, he did this then, he did that then. We are going to have some fun. And we're gonna talk about some myths, a few urban legends, and some secrets of Cabot's Pueblo. And some of these things you guys might know, some you might not know, some might be a surprise. And I want to thank Audrey Mo and Jish Gante, who is one of our docents and on the history committee, for putting together information um, for me to help me sort of structure what I wanted to say. And it's been a lot of fun uh, taking sort of this irreverent look at, at Cabot, because I, I don't know if it's a way that all of you have looked at him before. So, first we're going to go through, through some things that are myth or reality, and you're going to have to decide. And the first one, snakes. Yes. 
There are snakes up at the Pueblo. And as you can see, there's a cement trough. It's located in the living room. Now, if you've been to the Pueblo and you've seen Cabot's bathroom on the first floor opposite the Harry Potter bedroom, <laughs> it's a tiny little bathroom and there was no tub or shower. So, was this his bathtub? He was eccentric. He could have put it in his living room. Was it a watering trough for Merry Christmas? Well, Merry Christmas wasn't alive back then, so she wasn't drinking water out of the trough. So the myth going about is Cabot kept snakes in the trough, and when he would leave the Pueblo in the evening or extended period of time, he'd take the snakes out and they would go about the Pueblo grounds and if a burglar should come in, they would be greeted by a bunch of snakes and we all know Cabot was really good with all his reptilian friends up there. So, uh, and I just have to, you know, I, don't, I didn't find any uh, burglary reports when I went through the police blotter of 1941, 42, and 43. So maybe it worked, so what have we done? We still use it today. Every morning, we put the snakes back in the trough. <laughs> and every afternoon when we close up the Pueblo, we take the hook, we throw them around, and the Pueblo has never Myth. been broken into. Myth. So, are you sure? Nobody would ever know for sure unless they broke into the Pueblo, but I don't recommend it. I don't know which ones are poisonous. No, of course, uh, it's a myth, but it's fun that uh, even today somebody went on the tour and our docent was talking about the trough and he it was convinced that there really were snakes in the trough. Um, I'd say it was his cooling off tub after he got out of the hot middle springs. The next one, ghosts at the Pueblo. So, can you see Cabot? Yeah. Is it him or is it his ghost? I took this picture this morning. Oh, <laughs> what computer can do? <laughs> well, I think it's pretty cool, and if you're looking at this photo going, that's a really interesting perspective of the Pueblo, and it's an old photograph, obviously, because Cabot is in it, the image has been reversed. But it gives a really interesting take on what the Pueblo would look like if it was situated the other way. Judy and I were talking about it, and she said, something's wrong with that picture. And fortunately, it worked in us. Um, are there ghosts at the Pueblo? No. We all know that there is a very strong presence, and I believe Cabot has a very strong presence at the Pueblo. And thanks to our friend Audrey Mo, I do know that there is, that Cabot does overlook the Pueblo. And you can see him overlooking the Pueblo if you know where to look. And no, we're not going to tell you where to look. But if you're up at the Pueblo, uh, you can find Cabot and every day he is keeping us all safe and secure and not haunting us. Um, and if anybody ever does see a ghost up at the Pueblo, have you been at the bar first? <laughs> Next myth. This is an interesting one and it has been up for great debate because it could go either way. Cabot met with Teddy Roosevelt in the Yukon in 1901. And in the bio room up at the Pueblo, we have this picture. You can see Teddy Roosevelt. You can't see the blue line around him too clearly. Um, Teddy Roosevelt in the front row. And is Cabot in the picture with him? This was taken at a Dawson City Masonic Lodge meeting. So we told for a while that, uh, told people that Cabot actually did attend. He met Teddy Roosevelt. Well, he probably didn't, so this is going to fall into the myth column of his relationships with people. Although he did say that he shook Teddy Roosevelt's hand, but probably not in 1901 because he was up in Nome, and even though we know the Yerksa family could seemingly travel around the world with a transporter beam, for him to have gotten from Nome, Alaska, all the way to the Yukon Territories to meet with Teddy Roosevelt would have been very difficult even for a grand adventurer like Cabot. Um, this next one is, has been hushed up for decades because nobody likes talking about this subject. The murder room at the Pueblo. Is it there? Which floor is it on? Which room is it? Why does the history, yes. 
Why does the History Committee insist that this story not be publicly told? So is there a murder room in the Pueblo? Was Cabot Yerksa a serial killer hiding out in Desert Hot Springs? Was Portia? What did they have going on? I mean, look at the blood coming out of the windows. Obviously, something was going on up at the Pueblo. And thank you, Ivan, for putting this wonderful um, slide together for me. I'm sure he was asking, why do you want blood on this? Get out. Uh, <laughs> there is no murder room at the Pueblo, even though people, I, I, I guess somebody wants to romanticize about the possibility that there were murders up at, at Cabot's Pueblo. And uh, no, there's not. So we're going to go into another area of which has got debate up at the Pueblo, and in fact the desert, and Desert Hot Springs. UFOs. So, can you see the UFOs flying around? I was going to say that that was over Merry Christmas and then people go, oh, I can see it. It's not. I don't know where that picture is. I took it from the internet. Um, but lots and lots of stories about UFO sightings and Cabot and um, Portia being very involved in the UFO movement. And they were. Because on actual recordings, we have Cabot talking about his stories of UFOs and alien visitors. And we know that Cabot and Portia attended an annual camp meeting at Giant Rock near Landers, where UFO enthusiasts gathered. And we believe that their interest in visitors from outer space were consistent with their interest in mythic, mystic characters and vortexes. And again, going back to the incredible strong presence up at the Pueblo, it is easy to see that, wow, if they're going to land somewhere, Desert Hot Springs isn't a bad place to land. But myth or reality, and I've been thinking about this a lot, he found Merry Christmas, well he paid for Merry Christmas, and then he would leave for five months a year and Merry Christmas would wander around. And when he came back, Merry Christmas was always there. Could she be the missing UFO link? I mean, really, a burrow in the desert and cabins, and she's following him around. I don't know, kind of interesting that she, you know, she could have been the UFO alien visiting Cabot Yerksa. But it's a fun story to learn about, and there's much debate in the organization if this is a story that we're going to make part of a tour or a special conversation. Um, I personally look at it, if people will buy tickets, then we will do it. So we may be putting that together. All right, and we're gonna go back into the Pueblo because this is always interesting. Portia, don't leave me. Was Cabot Yerksa a controlling man? We know he built the incredible apartment upstairs, but seriously, who builds a staircase that small? So, the myth is he built it that small because he got Portia's belongings up in the apartment, but the staircase was too small for her to bring the stuff down. So she could never leave the Pueblo with her belongings, so she would never leave the Pueblo. So was he an endearing, loving man, or was he controlling his wife? Obviously an endearing, loving man, because theirs is one of the most wonderful love stories that I've ever read about, and I just, it's so wonderful. And as Cabot would do, he built with the materials he had, and if you can see, he built it between two walls, one of them being his stone fireplace. That's all the room there was, so that's why the staircase is that small. So it's very good that Porsche was 4'11", and Cabot was just under 5'8" because they could fit. And fortunately, so far since I started at the Pueblo, only one person got stuck in the staircase. Uh, that's a reality. No, it's really reality. And she blamed it because she had a water bottle in her fanny pack. And it was sort of like the, how do we get her out of here? And yeah, pop the bottle of water. And no, uh, she was able to um, get out of the staircase. All right. Secret rooms at the Pueblo. Is it really like the Winchester House? Are there staircases that go nowhere? Are there rooms behind walls? What's upstairs in the room that we can't seem to find access to? Is there access to that room 
from somewhere in the Pueblo that we just haven't found yet? Well, obviously we don't know because we haven't found it yet, but <laughs> we did find this secret room and everybody always puts a secret room where the plumbing for the bathroom is, but it held a couple of treasures. The two statues that you can see there. Wow. Yeah. And who knows, one day maybe we will find more if we go around and push on walls, although I have a feeling again that the members of the history committee have been through every square inch and every closet in that place. But I was thinking of all those stones, you, know, you push one in and it swings back. There's the collection of, I don't know, gold and things. Um, but it's just another interesting story about the Pueblo that there are lots of secret rooms there. This is the only one that we know about, um, but I think it would be really cool to find one and we could have Geraldo Rivera come out and <laughs> open up the secret room at Cabin's Pueblo. All right, we're going to talk about some legends up at the Pueblo, and they're, these are fun. Um, and I, I'm so glad to have these stories to share with you if you don't know them, uh, because they, they go to how important Cabot and the Pueblo were to the community and to people who had no real direct connection with the building, growing up with Cabot, or life at the Pueblo. But they were here in Desert Hot Springs, and they're just, it's just interesting about how much of a community center um, Cabot's Pueblo has become. So we have three legends to share today. They involve a Victrola, a weather station, and of course, Miss Janet Gaynor. That's the Victrola. It sits in the living room at the Pueblo, and the story, as I heard it, is a young man was riding around um, Miracle Hill, and he stumbled upon an old home. And he, as young men do, because I've done the same thing at that age, you go in and explore because the house was open. And he saw the Victrola and a bunch of old records. And he grabbed some of the records because it looked like the place was deserted, and he took them home. He wanted to listen to them. And a few years later, when the Pueblo was up and he could go through the Pueblo, he went inside and he saw the Victrola and he realized he had stolen some records from Cabot Yerksa. So he rushed back home and brought the records back to the Pueblo to return them to the rightful owner. And those records and the Victrola are still there, part of the Pueblo, and that gentleman is still a resident of the Coachella Valley and a good friend to the Pueblo, um, Dr. Richard, Rod Richard Rogers. So we thank him for being uh, a mostly honest young man, and, and at least he brought the, the records back. This is, come on, don't stop working on me now. That's the studio building, which is, as Cabot was getting so popular, he had to have an apartment complex built for all of his guests um, behind the, the main Pueblo building. And um, when you go up to the front door of the first floor apartment, you can see a weather station. And people did report on wind conditions and the weather up in Desert Hot Springs because we didn't have apps on our iPhones back then. And the news media needed to know what the weather was and what the wind conditions were, get it out on the radio so people knew what to expect. So not only was Cabot's uh, tourist destination a great place to learn history and learn about Cabot and his incredible life, if you were up there and have seen the weather rock, which is the best yes. weather telling device in the entire world, which I love because when I was up there once, a woman was reading the sign and she said, oh my God, how did he know? <laughs> and if you don't know what the weather rock is, please go up and read the sign because then that statement makes perfect sense and you would just go, Ranch on Mirage. But the weather station wall is still there, and the studio apartment on the first floor is one of the new rooms that ha has recently been opened, so you can take a peek at the weather station and a peek um, into the studio apartment. And the next um, legend involves a legend, Janet Gaynor, the Academy Award winning actress. Um, I don't know if she had uh, a relationship or, or new Cabot, but we know that Cole did her taxes and she was a friend of the Pueblo. She loved being at the Pueblo and she and her husband made their home in Palm Springs 
And so she gave the Pueblo, and it's in the kitchen, this is a photograph of the kitchen, um, the lovely collection of copper pots. So we do have a, a wonderful piece of Hollywood memorabilia um, in Cabot's kitchen, and it was just lovely of her to give them to the Pueblo, and the two carts that are up in the parking lot that Ms. Gaynor gave to the Pueblo to put on display so people could see them. And I, I just, it's, it's remarkable. She cared about the Pueblo, the story, and she's now part of it and her history. And I, I, one day somebody's going to find a secret room and I'll have left something, something <laughs> behind, something good, I hope. Uh, okay, we're going to shift gears and we're going to have a little fun and play true or false. This is called audience participation. How well do you think you really know the Pueblo and some of the facts about Cabot and the Pueblo? So if you think you know the answer, shout it out. The three people back there and Lorraine, Audrey, you're not allowed to play. Okay, the first true or false. Merry Christmas is buried in the bluff behind the Pueblo so she can see her namesake in the San Jacintos for all eternity. Well, we know Cabot placed the Pueblo so you can look out from all of those rooms and see her in the mountain. So he loved his burrow, the UFO alien. And so Merry false. Christmas is buried false. in the bluff. True false. or false? False. false? Maybe. I dug up the bones yesterday. No. <laughs> it is false. She's not buried there, but I do have fun if I'm walking up there and tell people, be careful while you talk their bones underneath it's Merry Christmas. Second one. This was scandalous, I understand. Courtney and Audrey Moe petitioned the city to change the name of the street leading up to their ranch from Roosevelt to Yerksa Road. True. True. <laughs> it was named Yerksa Road when they bought the ranch. <laughs> Okay. At one time, the Coachella Music Festival thought about bringing the festival to DHS and using the Pueblo as a background. Oh, no. oh, fine. Yeah, but wouldn't it be great if they did? I mean, come on, look at what the festivals are doing in Indian Wells. We gotta get a music festival at DHS. Try. Let's try a little harder. No. Alright. Cabot Yerksa was a well-known ladies' man. Ladies, raise your hand. Who knew Cabot? How well did you know Cabot? So, true or false? True. And I didn't put this in the myth or reality section because I, I, I haven't seen it. And I, I think this is okay that we go public. Yeah, Cabot slept around. The book of 29 women, I understand, is floating out there that he, he was... Um, quite the, the, the amorous um, gentleman, so I wonder how many Yerks of children there really are <laughs> in Desert Hot Springs. No, he had his, it is true, but he had his true love in Portia, and the, the book went away. All right, this is an easy one. Cabot would have been a huge fan of the historical story. That's easy. Goes to strength of community the community tie, that every person in here cares about Cabot, the Pueblo, and his story. And if you can remember those old Heather Locklear shampoo commercials, where tell two friends and so on and so on. And that's what I know all of you do when you're talking to people about the Pueblo and you get excited about it and you tell people, oh, you could do this and oh, you could see the ghost and oh, you can see Janet Gaynor's copper pots um, and all of the fascinating things about Cabot that's up at the Pueblo, and they tell two friends, and they tell two friends. And I'm happy to report that as of this year, we have surpassed last year's number of tour admissions, and we're closing in on um, the 2012-13 year, which was a very good year when the Pueblo went on the historical registry, and it was a big push for us. So we are um, growing in popularity, which is very exciting. So that was true. All right, this one's another easy one. The best party of the year is going to be May 16th <laughs> when we present Boot Scoot Gala and we are honoring the Desert Hot Springs Historical Society. True, true, true. true. 
We've changed the awards from what they previously were, and we, we are now presenting, this is going to be the inaugural year of the Cabot's Pueblo Museum Awards of Distinction, honoring those individuals and groups, businesses, who are bettering their community. And I know that the Desert Hot Springs is definitely bettering the community, and when we were discussing who we wanted to honor with um, our inaugural Community Partnership Award, um, choosing the Historical Society was just a unanimous and very, very easy selection to, to choose. Um, so I'm hoping that everybody in here will come up and support the Pueblo and enjoy a really fun evening. It's going to be different than it was in years past. No more buffet, table service. We're going to have a dance floor, a really fun DJ, a very short program, and of course we get to clap for ourselves. Um, I love these three shots of the Pueblo. The, the one that Cabot signed, Cabot whittling, and again Cabot as a young man. And now that I'm um, stewarding the Pueblo as the executive director, it's been just a thrilling eight months up there. And so much has changed. And I'm so appreciative to the board, as I said, because they were so welcoming in listening and helping enact ideas to really enhance the experience up at the Pueblo. And we have. We've opened up new rooms that were previously closed to the public. Um, with the help of the History Committee, we've restructured the tour. It's now our signature tour with the goal of interesting, enticing, and intriguing people so they will want to come back again and again and tell their friends and local people and visitors to the Coachella Valley to come up to the Pueblo and learn about Cabot and his story. We've worked on the grounds a lot and Ed, Sylvia, thank you for your leadership and helping us put that together. And most of all, up at the Pueblo, we've been working with local businesses to make everything happen, which has just been wonderful. Ed and Sylvia with the crew that they brought to work up at the Pueblo, to Ivan and Brianna who are doing our printing and our wonderful, wonderful work um, for us, our postcards, and um, Jim's painting, who has done some work for us. Um, uh, we've got the plants from the Desert Hot Springs Florist and Nursery. I don't think I'm forgetting anybody. Oh, Rocky Signs. We have new signs that are up at the Pueblo. So when people are in the parking lot, they're not doing this. They actually see a sign that says, go that way. <laughs> and can find their way to the training post to get a ticket. And also very wonderful for all of us up at the Pueblo. We have incredible partnerships um, with the Miracle Springs Resort. They help us when we need to put people, our guest artists that come to visit for our weekends, help us afford rooms so they can come and stay someplace wonderful and comfortable, to Two Bunch Palms, to the city, of course, Southern California Edison. They are remarkable, um, helpful to us. Mission Springs Water District. Without them, we wouldn't have the, the, the best I have a bottle of it with me. I grabbed one on my way here. Yeah. Um, the best water yeah. <laughs> anywhere, despite what those voting people in Virginia or wherever they were may have said. Uh, to the Rotary for their incredible support. And of course, to the Historical Society. So we've been very busy. And what's next for the Pueblo? And I want to go into this because I think it's important because you are all Pueblo ambassadors, and I think it's important for all of you to know where we're going, because Cabot built the foundation for us to be able to do this, and Ginger and Peggy aren't here tonight, but they were the former staff and the, the museum um, director and curator who inventoried Cabot's collection, and if you didn't know, there are more than 8,000 different pieces and photographs, and they spent three years inventorying the collection. We now know what Cabot had. And it's safely stored, inventoried, locked up. We know where it is. What you see in the Pueblo is just a very small part of Cabot's incredible collection. 
So what are our goals? We need to keep it financially stable. Of course, we have to protect and preserve the Pueblo, and we will always be a positive destination in Desert Hot Springs. And I'm just going to say this because everybody always hears about the bad side of Desert Hot Springs. In all of the time that I've been up at the Pueblo and have been talking to people, there have been no acts of graffiti or violence against the building. That's right. People don't hop the fence right. and hang out on the grounds. They don't camp out and build fires and drink. There's such a wonderful respect for the Pueblo, and that's because everybody has learned be respectful of Cabot, and so I thank all of you for um, being wonderful leaders and helping instill that respect in the community. Of course, we're going to continue sharing Cabot's amazing story, but what I think is one of the most exciting things that we're embarking on, and we've been in the middle of doing um, since the collection was inventoried, is we are getting ready to open up Cabot's original museum space in the Pueblo, and it hasn't been open for more than 50 years. So we can really show, through permanent and rotating exhibits, Cabot's incredible collection and photographs and his paintings and the pottery and the textiles, which will help enhance the story, tell new stories, and continue to bring new people to the Pueblo, and hopefully bring people so you're thinking, oh, what am I doing on a Saturday afternoon? I'll go up to the Pueblo and check out the museum, see what we've got on display. And it's been quite an endeavor, because this is what the Pueblo Gallery um, looked like. Oh, crap. I pressed it twice, and to go back, Close, break, close your eyes. Where am I? Well, trust me. Oh, I didn't need to do that. Close your eyes again. There we go. What did we learn today? Sorry about that, folks. Nothing is ever perfect in the world because perfect is boring. There we go. Yeah, click on from current slide. That's what it used to look like. It's sort of two halves of a great big space. It, it was full of boxes and stuff and a lot of really gross dead things and when they are dead a long time, they puff up. And um, it's been a lot of work. And the transformation has begun and we're getting it started. Wow. So what have we done? Wow. We installed new energy efficient LED lighting so you could really see. Um, the walls have been repaired and painted in the Cabot's blue, which you can't tell from the photograph, but it's that lovely soft Mr. Furby shirt color. <laughs> good, color. Uh, good, good color. Um, the windows have been repaired and cleaned, and the display cases have been revitalized, and we've reworked the public entry from outside the gallery space, where we will have visitors enter the, enter the gallery. Um, and just this, we, just, we put these up, um, just so I could take these pictures. Just an idea, the room itself is part of the collection and we're not gonna change the room. We're not gonna put drywall over the wood studs and cover up the pipe because this is how Cabot had it and the cases are the cases that Cabot had. We weren't quite sure if we were gonna be able to use them, but some real polish and grit. Alicia Augustine spent many, many hours in there cleaning up the glass cases and they look wonderful. So there's the uh, Ted Davis painting, Buffalo Bill chair, and the painting on the right was just donated by Cabot's granddaughter, Lori. She was here a couple of months ago. And it is another original painting that Cabot did of a seascape. And it will be on display. These are Cabot's bones, skins, and furs. And if people had been in the Pueblo and you could look up the staircase that goes up, there was kind of this dusty fur thing on wood. Um, and it's gone, and now in the place we've got the big bones, and then the smaller bones, and some furs, and some skins, and a smaller case. And this is going to be really fun, because we are developing a kids' tour, the bone skins and fur tour for kids, because it's very important to bring children up to museums, any kind of museums, so they look at them as fun 
and really engaging places to be in so they grow up to be adults who like going to museums. So we're going to be putting together for next year the bone skins and fur tour and then we're going to take the kids into the Ramada and they'll make their own little um, Cabot adobe brick. So it'll be a lot of fun. And then every so often a new treasure comes along and these are photographs that nobody in this room has ever seen because we just found them. Um, a gentleman in DHS recently passed away and a resident found three envelopes of negatives that had, were from Cabot Yerksa, postmaster, married to, uh, mailed to a friend of his in New York, but they weren't mailed as from the envelope. They were addressed with his name on it, but we don't know if they were mailed. And fortunately, there's a wonderful place that was able to take these very old negatives and digitize them. Judy, thank you for doing that. So you can see, we know Cabot was postmaster, and we think these photographs were taken in and around the time he was um, postmaster in Sierra Madre. And I chose these two because on the right, you can see with the horse-drawn carriage, the window, and it says Sierra Madre Post Office in the window. And this picture on your right, my left, um, it's, it's washed out, but it's in backwards. You can see this, it's the same windows. So we believe that's Cabot's office at the Sierra Madre Post Office when he was postmaster. So we keep getting more new and fun information to learn more about Cabot. And now we've got this one picture of a woman standing in front of a pier. We have no idea who she is. I think she's Dolly Levi, but we, she's the Gibson girl. But we don't know who she is, and I'm sure by this time next year the History Committee will know everything about her. Um, so none of this happens. Everything that we do up at the Pueblo, we're a 501c3 nonprofit. We're able to do what we do because people donate money to Cabot's Pueblo. And they take tours. They invite their friends to take tours. They shop in the trading post. They come to our artist weekend. We have one starting tomorrow. The Hopi Kachina carvers are going to be at the Pueblo Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. You can watch them make the Hopi um, Kachina dolls which is, and just, it's, I'm looking forward to it because I've never seen them do it and I don't have an artistic bone in my body. Um, and they come to our annual event. And Cabot believed in a strong community. I'm gonna keep going back to that because that's the, that's the common thread in Cabot and his history. And together we can make the world a better place. And it does take a strong community to keep Cabot's Pueblo safe and secure. So thank you for letting me talk. And please come up to the Pueblo if you haven't been up soon, because it is, it's a new experience, especially if you haven't been here, you've been up there since September. Come see the new rooms. And Audrey, thank you. Courtney, thank you. Larry, thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Yeah, that was great fun. Uh, I thought I knew everything I needed to know about Cabot, and obviously, uh, even when we were researching the book and stuff, we uh, kept learning new and more and more new things. And it seems like every day we're coming up something new. So it's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. And you're a great addition to the community. <laughs>